have it a lot harder than men do because vaginas can get easily infected a lot more than a penis can. What an interesting thing to say, especially at the beginning of episode 291 of Radio Free and Smith, which is all about jism. No, we're not talking about that kind of... Make the white stuff come out type of thing. We're talking about Gorilla Incendiary Sabotage Mutineer or Gravity Impel Slaying Machine, General Imperialism Social Murder, Gnostic Idiosyncrasy Sonic Militant, God in the Schizoid Mind, Grubby Incest Stripper Mastitis, Get Incinerated Sorrow Mass, or even Grift Illusory Slave Money on their uh, Greatest Hits album. The most cursed of all bands where almost all original members are... With one bullet. Mortis. D to the ceased. G I S M. One of those wacky. metal bands that I'm so into. In fact, they're probably the strangest Japanese metal band, or certainly up there. And despite being a rather old band, they've been in the news quite a bit recently. Yeah, I'm not chasing the algorithm at all. <laughs> no, but seriously, I've actually been meaning to do this episode for a while. Jism were one of my major entry points into the weirder side of a lot of Japanese metal way back in the day. In fact, I think they were for a lot of more extreme metal-minded people. And they are a pretty darn esoteric band, if you couldn't tell by the fact that their name has stood for like 10 different abbreviations over the years. Given that they seem to like breaking things down, probably the best way to explain what Jism is would be to break this band down into their individual components and find out how they contribute to crafting their overall sonic madness. <laughs> First component, one Sakavi the vocalist, who passed away just the other week. Honestly, to the surprise of a lot of people. I mean, I always assumed he was either already dead or was some kind of a mortal terror because Sakavi was kind of bonkers. He was well known to running into crowds of people at Jism's live shows with a chainsaw, throwing fireworks into crowds at said shows, beating up random people going to the concert with a club, threatening the audience with a loaded revolver, firing gunshots on stage, allegedly stabbing a man for wearing a boot like Jism shirt and even going to prison for a bit for attacking a salaryman on the Tokyo subway for staring at him with a homemade flamethrower. In addition to that, he was also responsible for the weird kind of collage art you see on Jism's album covers, which I gotta think was a pretty big influence on in the artistic style of bands like Napalm Death and Gorefest. I mean, even as late as 2015 on their greatest hits album, there is a whole lot of real wacky stuff going on in those album covers. Sort of treading the line between some kind of genuine social commentary and just being as offensive as possible. He's basically Gigi Allen, but you take away all the poppers and weird sex and just replace it with more violence. I consider him to be something of an ideological role model. But more importantly than all of that, he was one hell of a vocalist. I mean, check this out, 1984, baby. The first song most people hear from Jism starts out with Sakavi making some weird schizophrenic people noises before launching into maybe the earliest recorded example of extreme metal style vocals before then going back into weird schizo. And he kind of jumps back and forth between these two styles for the rest of the song. And you might not realize it's the same guy doing all the vocals until you get to this part where he starts jumping in between both styles, in between each word, and steadily descending even farther into madness for the end of the song, featuring a weird black metal yelping noise, followed by whatever the hell this is. Weirdos. Pretty good stuff. In addition to being an example of a very early extreme metal style vocalist with all the growling and shrieking, he was also one of the earliest examples I can think of of somebody taking those kind of extreme metal vocals and putting weird effects on them. He can also be seen as something of a porno grind pioneer in that he keeps yelling stuff like gonorrhea penis. All right, that's pretty bonkers for 1984. That would be weird today. Somebody just started yelling stuff like that in the middle of the song. But Sakavi did it. He did just about every weird vocal styling you can think of way back in 1984, 1983. I'm hearing a lot of strange stuff. Got that weird whispered Yakuza kind of shout followed up with more of his nasty growls and shrieks. And honestly, I think he even invented the deathcore pig vocal. A 
플로 주문을 하던가? Okay, maybe that last claim was a bit of a stretch. What I'm saying is, he was a really unique, strange, and kind of ahead of his time vocalist. And it's unsurprising that in addition to grindcore bands like Napalm Death and black metal bands like Dark Throne claiming Jism as a major influence, two extreme metal bands perhaps most known for their wide variety of bizarre vocals, that being Impetigo and Macabre, have specifically pointed out Jism as a foundational aspect of their sound. Second component, and perhaps the most important one, depending on who you ask, would be the guitarist Randy Uchida, who in addition to being one of the most important facets of said wackos and jism, also had his own solo project called the Randy Uchida Group that played, well, some damn good melodic 80s metal with some really unique kind of angular guitar playing and a lot of interesting sort of subtle string bends, very loudness adjacent while still maintaining its own style. I like the vocalist in this band a lot too. Maybe he's not as technically good as your Bruce Dickinson's or whatever, but I think he brings his own sense of soul to it. Kind of reminds me of Magnesium a little bit like that. Also those high notes will scare off the posers. <laughs> That chorus be catchy as fuck, yo. But remember, this band's called the uh, Randy Uchida group, not the uh, just random vocalist guy group. So obviously the guitar playing is going to be the star of the show. And it does not disappoint. This dude had a real ear for hyper-melodic, catchy leads that stick in your head while still demonstrating quite a bit of technical ability. But you gotta wonder, how the heck are you going to work that into the weird metal punk that Jism's rocking? Well, there's a couple ways that he makes it work. Option one is to take that hyper-technical shredding style but instead of going for the super melodic stuff you really lean into the angular and aggressive aspects of your guitar playing so you've still got all the two-handed tapping and the whammy bar abuse and the hyper speed arpeggios but you concentrate on intentionally dissonant and mean sounding intervals between each of the notes you still keep the solos very long memorable and narrative driven like each of these solos is sort of a story in itself it's just that when he does stuff like this it's telling more of a horror story and less of an epic heroic journey like you might find in a power metal context. Option two is you use your guitar skills to link together and segue between harsh punk meets metal type riffs in an unexpected way. For example, you might start a song off with these fast combinations of notes linking together simpler, more percussive music phrases before then really hitting a whammy bar dive bomb to move into more of Sikavi's proto-extreme metal harshness and then transition into the verse with some natural harmonics. Now you've got this thrash riff, but to the end of each phrase you've also added a Tony Iommi style single finger bar across the strings, that noise. So you're still utilizing all your guitar tricks, you're just making them work in this harsh, sort of hardcore punk context. And it is very harsh. I mean, that guitar tone, I'm not going to say it's quite sweet as Chainsaw, but it's definitely very similar to what Napalm Death would do years later on the Scum album. Probably the nastiest shit you'd hear in 1984. This is not one of those weird shredding mini segues I was talking about. Those are all over Jism's releases, and they kind of give everything its own sort of unique character. Hearing that level of highly technical heavy metal guitar playing on a record that aesthetically has more in common with a band like Discharge. The third way he makes this kind of shredding work is uh, by not changing his style at all. He just goes full power metal quite a lot of the time, and it makes an interesting contrast with those sort of like proto black thrash hardcore punk vaguely death metal whatever riff. Randy Uchida was, as I mentioned earlier, perhaps the most important part of what made Jism Jism. And as is tradition for Jism, he is now... Mortis. Having been the first member of Jism to die way back in 2001. But despite dying pretty young, I'd say he left a pretty massive impact on Japanese metal in general, and maybe even Visual K in particular. I know that Chisholm's music itself was kind of a good bridge for me, moving from you know death metal and black metal into Visual K stuff. Randy Uchida certainly had the look for that sort of thing. Third component. You got bass players, plural, because Jism went through a few. The first one that sticks out to me was their bass player on their 90s stuff, that being Kichi Takahashi, who was originally the vocalist for Sabra Bells, who you might remember back from the Bells of Lab episode as being maybe the first Japanese black metal band, black metal in the merciful fate sense. Don't really have time to talk about Sabra Bells that much today. Probably should give them their entire episode at some point. The important thing to note is, like Randy, he comes from a background that you wouldn't expect to find in a punk band, and yet, he fits right in. You see, all of uh, Jism's 90s material came out in a 2001 compilation entitled Sonic Crime Therapy, where apart from a couple of the uh, improvised tracks, the songs didn't even have names. They would just say like, are you 
three or RU1 for songs that are written by Randy Uchida, RUNS1, two, whatever for songs written by Randy Uchida and Sakevi, and then songs labeled KI1, two, and three that were written by Kiichi. And despite him coming from the background that he comes from, totally sounds like a standard Jism song. <laughs> It's also worth noting that despite this material being recorded over a decade after Jism's debut album, it fits in perfectly with material from that time period, as well as a lot of more proto-death metal, it even has glass beats. Just a testament to how Jism are always ahead of the extreme metal curve. Also interesting enough, given who wrote this song, there's quite a bit of kind of heavy metal doom and gloom to it that you don't always hear in other Jism tracks. Maybe working in some more of his earlier Sad Rebels influences. Again, I really should do an episode on that band. Point is, you have people like Kichi running around coming from this sort of doomy occult heavy metal background. Then you got another guy that played bass for Jism, that being a guy named Ghost, who was also in the band Ghoul, who were Jism contemporaries. Don't get them mixed up with that terrible band that Raw Sewage is in nowadays. I'm fucking gay! And probably the band in Japan that had the most in common with Jism, purely on a musical level. They played some kind of really nasty variety of hardcore punk that also had quite a lot in common with early black metal, as you're no doubt hearing right now. A lot of this stuff ain't too far off from Celtic Frost or Hellhammer. And like Jism, they had a pretty wacky dude on vocals. In this case, it was a fellow by the name of Masami Hosoya, who actually had no right hand because he got blown off in a dynamite explosion. Yeah, who right. kind of ended when that book was collapsed on stage in 1989 and remained uh, comatose until he died in 1992. So another band plagued by unfortunate deaths. And in fact, Ghost himself, the uh, bassist that was in Jism and Ghoul. Hey, 2006. Don't even really know why. Can't find too much info on this band. In fact, the only reason I know about them is because they were on a compilation with Casbah and Saver Tiger, the first band of Hide from X Japan, who is also in the realm of Mortis. Seriously, man, there's so many dead people in this episode, it's depressing. One guy who isn't dead is the bassist from Jism's two full-length albums from the 80s, that being a fellow by the name of Cloudy, who also played bass in another 80s heavy metal band called Front Gorilla. Apologies in advance for the surface noise, but this is by far the most obscure band being discussed on this episode about obscure bands. Because there ain't no way to know how this shit's ever come out on CD. It's a damn shame because it's some good fucking stuff. It's another one of those female-fronted Japanese bands I enjoy so much, but this is very different from something like Mari Hamada or Shoya. It's a lot scuzzier and nastier. It actually has quite a bit in common with the Plasmatics, which, uh, honestly, another band pretty comparable to Jism in terms of their violent stage shows and overall post-apocalyptic nastiness. Anyways, I really dig this chick's vocals. She's got a nice snarl to them while retaining a hint of femininity. Damn shame I can't find anything else she ended up recording. But there you go. Three different notable bases in Jism, all of them coming from very different backgrounds, whether it be occult heavy metal, proto black thrash hardcore punk, or female vocalist metal that only I like. Interestingly, in the case of that last band, the guitarist from Front Gorilla also played in another band called Poison Arts, who are another incredibly influential Japanese hardcore band. But like with Sab Rebels, discussing them too much on this episode would probably be getting a little bit too much into the weeds. Maybe I'll just do an overall Japanese hardcore episode someday. I mean, you gotta like Poison Arts, dude. Their first album's got a guy punching a dragon in the face on the cover. <laughs> Fucking awesome. The final ingredient for Jism. Gotta be their longtime drummer Hiroshima, who also played in the Randy Uchida group. And this guy seemed like he was on his way to making it out of Jism alive, given that after Jism kind of petered out in the 90s, he left music entirely to become the owner of an izakaya. And if you don't know what an izakaya is, you really should watch the Hate Bus stream I do every Thursday. It's got a food review segment on there where you can learn about all kinds of stuff, like what the hell an izakaya is. Links are in the description. Up to see you there. Bye. <laughs> But for real though, an izakaya is like a cross between maybe like a saloon and like a tapas bar. They got booze and snacks and they usually cater to people just getting off work. And you would think running something like that, homeboy could have void the curse of jism. But alas, Mortis. 
Just last year, as a matter of fact. Don't even know what he died from. So you got all these different people, many of whom are now dead, from a whole lot of different musical backgrounds, coming together to make whatever the hell jism is. So what do you end up with? You end up with that good shit is what you end up with. Rock and roll, motherfucker! It's kind of funny how many old school hardcore elitist snobs give this band a pass. Even though as you're hearing right now, quite a bit of what they play is essentially fucking power metal. Just with a much rawer production and weirder vocals. I mean, not that I have a problem with that. I think it gives this band a lot of character and a unique sound. And it helps them tie together all these power metal elements with the more kind of proto-black thrashy shit. It's like this riff right here, this is basically a discharge riff. And yet it coexists with all of Randy Uchida's harmonized power metal lead guitar stuff perfectly. Thanks in no small part, of course, due to his penchant for working in these really memorable sort of transition bits linking the two styles together like with this bit right here he's really good at throwing in these little accent bits it's one of the most noticeable features of his guitar playing style but he also has a prodigious talent for writing longer lead guitar sections like the one you're hearing right now it sounds almost like something that could have come off an ex-japan album and yet it's on this weird 80s hardcore punk album from 1984 and it doesn't sound out of place it's all part of jism's unique sound world that makes 1984 sort of this undisputed hardcore punk metal whatever the fuck classic that's what's most definitely up. But Jism actually has two full-length albums. I don't really count Sonic Crime Therapy from 2001 as being a full-length. I see it as more of a compilation. I'm sure some people will argue with me about that in the comments, but whatever. <laughs> but yeah, Detestation, that first album, pretty much everybody knows about it, acknowledges it as this classic. But the follow-up album, Military Affairs Neurotic, or if you go by what it says on the cover, Military Affairs Neurotic. You cannot go on or keep ringing my bell! You disturb me! It is honestly just as good of an album, if not better in some aspects, but it's highly under-recognized, perhaps because there wasn't a proper CD version of it for years and years. But it's got my personal favorite jism song on it, and probably their best stab at crafting a pure power metal epic. Another part of why this album might not be as well regarded as its predecessor, Detestation, would have to be the production, which is nowhere near as raw as that album was, although it's still quite a bit nastier sounding than this kind of melodic metal usually is. Personally, I love it because it lets me hear Randy's riffs better, particularly during these, as always, seamless transitions between the power metal -y stuff into the harder edge shit, which in many songs on this release is a little bit less DB hardcore and a little more like dark, sort of mid-paced thrash metal, again with sort of an occult black metal feeling to it. Also, Mr. Izakaya owners busting out plenty of cool drum fills, which is always appreciated. And damn if Sakebi's vocals aren't just straight up 90s black metal, but in 1987. It sounds like Rob motherfucking Darkin. But yeah, the main reason this is my favorite Jism song is because that harmony slaps so hard. One of the things that really made their first album, Detestation, stick out was the large amount of variety in musical content. I mean, you heard all the different kinds of shit I've been playing off it over the course of this episode. That's back in force with Military Affairs Neurotic, namely in the form of Randy Uchida utilizing an entirely new bag of guitar tricks. Like this song right here dips into this weird fusion of post-punk and thrash metal, resulting in a very interesting sort of dark atmospheric background back and forth between different riff types. That also gives Cloudy's bass lines a much more notable place of prominence within the mix. It's almost kind of dancey. And I really like this rising sort of response riff to that initial very dark section. It gives the song a real sense of musical range. Speaking of which, check out this cool little counterpoint variation. Sort of a re-examination of themes from that initial riff, leading into sort of a more standard heavy metal kind of section, albeit one that still preserves that very post-punk Joy Division style backbeat on the drumming. And again, really interesting opportunities for Cloudy to get more exploratory with his bass guitar playing running all up and down the neck before we finally drop into that initial riff leading into the solo section for this song, which is also very experimental in its sound. Almost kind of doing a jam band sort of thing. This really bouncy, elastic bass line over which Randy Uchida lays down all these Middle Eastern sounding scale runs before then jumping into his impeccable sort of power metal style which is always are amazing. We definitely lost this guy too early. Really unique, interesting guitar player. 
The Military Affairs Neurotic is a really interesting sort of album. That same sort of inventive songwriting I highlighted on the two songs I played, it's all over. So even if you're a detestation fan, you haven't really looked in the Military Affairs Neurotic, you're doing yourself a disservice. And if you're a fan of like heavy music at all and you don't listen to Jism, you're definitely doing yourself a disservice. I mean, this is one of the best bands of all time. I could talk about them forever. I mean, look at that runtime. This is a long fucking episode, dude. And hopefully it gave you a lot to chew on regarding Jism as artists and their place in the overall history of heavy music. Like I said, I think we're one of the best bands ever. Hopefully you agree with me, otherwise you're wrong, but even if that's the case, Thanks anyways for watching, listening, or whatever you did, and I'll see you next time. You got me now, or you figured me out, you fucking income fucking poop. Oh, yeah, yeah.